in your life. Hey, everyone, and welcome to our 11th FreeBSD Friday. I'm Deb Goodkin, and I'm the Executive Director of the FreeBSD Foundation. So first, I'd like to thank all of you for watching this, whether you're watching it now being live streamed or you're watching the recording. So I do want to let you know that if you have any questions during the talk today, you can post your questions in the IRC channel, and we will post that in the link. Well, actually, well, we'll post the uh, channel in the uh, chat box. Um, so anyway, I and, um, and you can also go to our FreeBSD Fridays page. That's the URL we'll post in our um, in the chat window here because you already have the window open. So anyway, if you have a question, proceed it by queue, and uh, the speaker will answer questions at the end of this talk. So today, our presentation is an introduction to Risk Five on FreeBSD by Mitchell Horn. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about Mitchell. Mitchell got his start with FreeBSD in 2018 as one of the FreeBSD Foundation's co-op students after toying around with Linux in his teens. For the last two years, he has worked on making improvements to FreeBSD's RISC-V support, which earned him a commitment in early 2019. He has an enthusiasm for open source software and an innate desire to learn how computers actually work. Mitchell completed his engineering degree at the University of Waterloo earlier this year. And now he's celebrating his newfound freedom by backpacking across his kitchen, living room, and even to the park down the street. So now I'll hand this off to Mitchell. Thank you, Deb. Just gonna open the window here. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, this is my first ever FreeBSD talk, so uh, I'm excited and uh, bear with me. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, FreeBSD on the RISC-V platform, um, kind of the history of it, how it started, some of the improvements we've seen in the last couple of years, um, some of the RISC-V hardware that's out there in the world today and um, where I see this platform going in the future. Um, so we're gonna start out simple. What is RISC-V? Well, um, it's an instruction set architecture uh, or a computer architecture. Um, basically, it is the specification that defines the interface between the CPU and the software that runs on it. So all software that runs on a computer at some level gets turned into um, simple instructions that the CPU can understand. And RISC-V defines those instructions. Um, goes without saying, but it is a RISC architecture or a reduced instruction set computer. That's basically a philosophy that says we try to keep our instructions um, simple and to have few of them instead of many. Um, there's a couple unique things about RISC-V um, in comparison to existing uh, instruction set architectures. First is that it has been, uh, it has an open source license and it has from the get-go. Um, the idea is that anybody can take risk five, implement it, change it, extend it, um, and they don't need to pay licensing fees for that. So that's that benefits um, people in academia, makes it a good platform for research, makes it a good platform for um, teaching. And for the same reason, it's uh, also a benefit for um, commercial products, it lowers the barrier of entry for people who might wish to implement a CPU. Um, it's not just anyone can come along and, and implement an ARM CPU or a, a x86 CPU. You have to kind of go through the official channels and follow the licensing constraints. So it's kind of similar to FreeBSD's license in that sense. Um, also, RISC-V is designed to be extendable. It's designed to be modular so that um, 
the, the portions of the ISA that you care about can be implemented and the ones that you don't, don't have to be. Um, we'll see about that in the next slide. The main downside uh, to RISC five as a architecture so far is, well, it's just young, it's just new. Um, it was kind of released in 2010 out of uh, UC Berkeley where it started as a research project. And when you're going up against existing CPU architectures that have been running for decades, that's kind of an uphill battle. So um, there's a lot of work on both hardware and software sides of things um, that needs to be done. And um, that's just a reality of where it's at at the moment. Um, so the RISC-V ISA is split up into base and extension components. If you want to implement a RISC-V CPU, you choose a base, perhaps a 32-bit or 64-bit, depending on your use case. And you can choose um, any amount of extensions that you like. So interestingly, things that are fundamental in other processors are like multiply divide instructions, uh, atomics or floating point are not required by RISC V. So, if your goal is just to make the tiniest uh, microprocessor, 32 bit microprocessor, and it's only going to have a single core, you know you don't need atomics, they don't need to be implemented. It's not required. Um, on, the end of, on the other end of that, you can implement a core with as many extensions as you want. Um, they've also left room in the specification for 128-bit ISA uh, in the future, although that's not uh, it's not well defined yet. Um, at the bottom, I've got a couple examples of valid um, RISC V core description. So RV32I, the I stands for integer and is implicit in the base. Uh, ISA, but that would be the simplest core you could you could implement. Um, RV64GC would be kind of a Unix class processor, and um, it even can get as complicated as RV64IMAFDQCBJPVN, um, which implements a bunch of extensions. Some of the ones you see here. That's obviously an extreme example, but um, the point is just to say that the choice is up to the implementer. Um, that's most of what I want to say about the RISC V ISA itself. Um, there are better resources to learn about that if you want to know more. I would say that the uh, the spec itself is quite readable, um, but I'll mostly be focusing on FreeBSD. Um, so FreeBSD supports a, a, a number of CPU platforms. Um, this is the full list. Most common and most well supported is AMD 64, the 64-bit x86 instruction architecture. So that's what you'd find in a modern uh, PC. That's what uh, my laptop has in it right now. If you're watching from a laptop, it's probably what yours has. Um, of course, we support ARM CPUs, which is common in um, embedded applications. And for ARM64, is growing in the server market. And some niche architectures as well, like MIPS, PowerPC, Spark64 for a little bit longer. And uh, as of a couple of years ago, we added support for 64-bit RISC-V. So um, FreeBSC can run on a wide variety of different types of CPUs. And in order to support something like that, um, there are changes that have to happen in the kernel, in the user land, in uh, build infrastructure, packages. Like There's changes everywhere, but the goal is to make it kind of invisible from a user's perspective. Um, 
So to talk a little bit about FreeBSD's RISC V port, um, it was started, I believe, in 2015 by Ruslan Bukin. Um, he told me it took about six months of work full time in order to port uh, everything needed to boot to multi-user. Um, the largest portion of that work is the PMAP module in the kernel, which is responsible for um, constructing and managing hardware page tables. Um, and that's very specific to the CPU architecture in question. So I think our um, RISC V PMAP is something about 6,000 lines of code now. It would have been less back then, but um, that would be the biggest barrier for porting to a new platform. So it's a lot of work for sure. Uh, he based it on the ARM64 port, which was completed a couple years prior. And by February 2016, it was submitted to FreeBSD subversion. Um, some other details about our port. So it assumes RISC V64 GC. Um, this is kind of the base, the base I say expected for Unix capable processors. Um, we expect we expect that the CPU implements three privilege modes: machine mode, supervisor mode, and user mode. Uh, machine mode is where the firmware runs while the FreeBSD kernel will run in supervisor mode um, and applications in user mode. The interesting thing is that RISC-V itself doesn't require all of these to be implemented, um, but we do from FreeBSD's point of view, since most of the cores we're interested in running on um, support S mode. So um, we'll, we might come back to that point. Um, we support a 39-bit virtual memory scheme uh, with three levels of page table. Uh, this gives a 512 gigabyte virtual address space, which is adequate for the platforms that exist right now. RISC V also defines a 48-bit virtual memory scheme, um, and we'll probably see support for that in the future when there is a you know, the motivation for it. Um, the initial port used the Berkeley bootloader um, to boot the FreeBSD kernel. This is a firmware that runs in machine mode and it its job is basically to enter supervisor mode and uh, launch the FreeBSD kernel directly. Um, and we were using that for several years. Um, at the bottom here is just some of the FreeBSD make language. Uh, if you're familiar, or familiar with the FreeBSD build process, um, this is how you would specify uh, the RISC V target. Um, so I'd like to talk about some of the improvements we've seen in the last couple of years, because um, that's that is uh, how long I've been working on this project. Um, not all of this work was done by me, but it's what I've been around to see. Um, one of the first things I worked on was uh, support for kernel dumps, mini dumps, as they're called. Um, essentially, sometimes the kernel will encounter an unrecoverable error. And at that point, it panics and the system stops and the user has the chance to capture a kernel dump, which is basically the contents of the kernel's memory. Um, this is useful for debugging after the fact, can be useful for bug reports where the backtrace is not enough information. And, um, it's just, a, it's a good thing to have. Um, the reason it wasn't implemented up to that point is that in order to create a kernel dump, 
you have to know how to walk the virtual memory page table structure. So you have to be able to basically enumerate all the memory used by the kernel and copy it out. Um, and that's very CPU specific or CPU architecture specific thing to do. Um, so this was a fun thing for me to start with. It took me a few months to kind of learn everything involved in this process. Um, but as a, a contributor, I was happy to see it finally get committed. Um, transparent super page support. Uh, this was added, I think, somewhere in early 2019 by uh, Mark Johnson. Um, it's another virtual memory related feature. Um, at the smallest size, physical memory can be mapped to virtual memory in four kilobyte chunks. Um, however, applications often will you will want to map um, more than that in a contiguous range. So rather than mapping four kilobyte chunks 512 times, you can upgrade that to a two megabyte chunk. Uh, and in FreeBSD, that's known as a super page. Um, the reason it's called transparent is because this process happens automatically. So the user process doesn't need to request anything. Um, but if the kernel finds the right criteria where it can upgrade a mapping, um, it will do so. And if it finds that it needs to downgrade the mapping, it will do so without the user process knowing about it. And this is mainly a per performance uh, feature. Um, it's been around a, for a while, but it's part of the PMAP. So it has to be implemented independently for every uh, architecture that wants to support it. Um, and it's quite a tricky thing to do. So this was, at the moment, something we haven't really quantified. We haven't quantified the performance on RISC-V, but um, it's been shown to work well on other architectures. So it's a good thing to have for sure. Um, Open SBI. So I mentioned the Berkeley bootloader, the uh, M mode firmware that runs or uh, that boots FreeBSD. Um, sometime in 2019, the Open SBI project started. And it was basically intended to be a replacement for BBL uh, since that was being maintained, but there wasn't a lot of new functionality being added. And there was a de desire to make the um, bootloader process a little more flexible. Um, so in the ideal world, this would have been a drop-in replacement where you just, uh, instead of using BBL to boot FreeBSD, you use OpenSBI. Um, but actually, when uh, I tried to make this change, um, it exposed a couple of bugs that we had in our system. So it, it took some work um, in the interrupt controller driver to actually make this work. Um, but we can, we can boot with OpenSBI or BBL now. OpenSBI continues to kind of gain some new functionality, uh, new firmware functionality. And it seems to be that eventually BBL will become legacy software and OpenSBI will um, overtake it. So having support for this is important. Uh, we build it as a package, which is easy to distribute and install. Um, so you just package install OpenSBI and you can use it, which also makes the process of running FreeBSD on RIS-5 a little simpler. Um, also in 2019, we made the switch from uh, an external GCC tool chain to uh, the Clang LLVM that's uh, included in the FreeBSD base system. So work on a RISC-V backend for LLVM 
started around 2017. Um, I, from what I remember, it was kind of slow going effort with only a couple of people working on it. Eventually it got moved into the official LLVM repos and more people started to pay attention to it. And by the LLVM 9 release, it was um, made to be an official supported backend. Um, basically meaning it's, it's, it's stable enough to use. Um, so at that point, when FreeBSD gained the LLVM 9 um, release in its base, uh, we started to make changes to switch to LLVM. Um, so historically, FreeBSD used GCC as its base compiler. There was a version included in the base system. Um, and then when GCC switched to uh, switched its license to GPL version three, that was no longer compatible with uh, FreeBSD uh, and FreeBSD's license. So there's been a project for a number of years to uh, transition away from GCC and towards LLVM. And um, as of as of this year, every or as of FreeBSD 13, every uh, architecture that's supported can be built using um, LLVM and Clang rather than uh, GCC, which is a big accomplishment. And it definitely makes uh, building a FreeBSD target easier since anyone with a FreeBSD install already has the compiler they need. So it's as simple as the invocation you see at the bottom, just make target as RISC-5 build world. And there you go, you're cross compiling for RISC-5. Um, the FreeBSD bootloader uh, loader is, um, standard on on all platforms of FreeBSD, but we did not have support for it on RISC-5. This is definitely one of the most um, platform dependent features. So it has the same interface on, you know, uh, different platforms supported by FreeBSD, but how it's actually implemented changes quite a bit. Um, and it just hadn't been tackled to this point. But we want it because um, the FreeBSD kernel doesn't usually expect to be booted directly. It expects to be booted by FreeBSD's bootloader. Um, it provides, the loader provides facilities for configuring the kernel and loading other kernel modules. Um, that users might want otherwise difficult to achieve. Um, so I looked at a couple of ways of doing this. In the end, the, the simplest and kind of most friendly way was to build it as an EFI payload um, so that any RISC-V firmware that supports the UEFI spec um, can boot it. This is the same as what we do on ARM and ARM64, um, AMD64 as well. Although historically there have been other ways of building the bootloader. So the nice thing about that is we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, we're doing this in kind of a standardized way that other platforms already support and provide a good example of. So I'm gonna show you how the boot flow works. Um, this is the existing boot flow where we boot the FreeBSD kernel directly. Um, basically, uh, the CPU or emulator or whatever you're using enters OpenSBI first or uh, BBL. They're kind of alternatives in this sense. And the job of uh, both of those firmwares is to do some initialization 
enter the supervisor privilege mode and jump to a known address where FreeBSD is, the FreeBSD kernel is located. Um, so often the example address you see there. Um, it's not a very configurable process, but it works and it's simple. Um, seem to have messed up the slide. Okay. Uh, the new flow using the FreeBSD bootloader looks a little something like this. So we've gone from two stages to four stages and arguably more stages before this, but we're not interested in that. Um, so we still start in OpenSBI uh, in machine mode. OpenSBI will jump to U-Boot. Um, U-Boot is a pretty popular uh, firmware project developed by the Linux community mainly, and it supports a lot of platforms. It's quite configurable. Um, and we use it for ARM and ARM64. I think maybe other platforms too, but I'm not sure. Um, so we can use OpenSBI to jump to U-Boot rather than jumping directly to the FreeBSD kernel. U-Boot is a UEFI compliant firmware, so it knows um, it knows how to read and load an EFI payload from an EFI partition. Um, and that's exactly what it does. So it can find the FreeBSD loader, load it, and jump to it, which will then know how to find the FreeBSD kernel and do any configuration the user wants. Um, and ultimately, this gives us more flexibility in how we boot FreeBSD. So we can boot from UFS, CFS, or, or over the network, um, and we can configure the kernel before actually starting it. Um, so this is a this is mainly a useful thing for eventual users of the RISC-V platform. So RISC-V platforms, let's talk about it. Let's talk about some of the uh, the hardware that's out there and some of the software platforms that are out there. The main one uh, in my eyes right now is QMU. This is a pretty popular emulator that supports um, most CPU architectures and a bunch of different board configurations, peripherals, and um, is easy to install. There's a FreeBSD package for it. It has a built-in GDB server, so it makes debugging good. Basically, you can run a RISC-V system in this emulator on your AMD64 host. The downside of that, obviously, is your, to run non-native instructions on any CPU is slow. It's about 100 times slower than running native instructions, but it's still good enough. It's good enough to do development. It's good enough to boot FreeBSD, to look around. And um, as long as you're not trying to do any real intensive work, um, it's a good tool. So I call it my development platform of choice, choice being in quotation marks because I don't have any RIS-5 hardware. Um, Spike Simulator, similar. Uh, it's a software simulator, but note that simulator is different than emulator. Um, Spike was one of the first um, platforms that FreeBSD could run on, uh, mainly because it simulates an entire RISC-V CPU, um, as opposed to QMU, which tries to recreate the behavior of one. Um, but this is actually a good thing because it really helps software implementers check the low level details or um, check the CPU state instruction by instruction. Um, so for early bring up of a platform, 
this kind of tool is critical. But of course, it's very, very slow. Um, High Five Unleashed, this board was uh, released a couple years ago. I think one day it will be called the granddaddy of all RISC-V uh, hardware. And um, it was created by Sci-5 and, and sold for about $1,000. So they produced a couple hundred of them and that was it. Uh, so anyone who didn't get one or didn't want to pay the price for one of these boards, essentially there were no other options for Unix capable RISC-V hardware. Um, it's got five cores, four of which are available to um, the OS and there's a QMU model simulation um, that you can use. It's good enough to test out device drivers and things like that. This was an interesting one that appeared, I think, in 2019. It seemed like a um, platform capable of running Unix because it was 64-bit uh, GC extensions, and it was much cheaper. It was only $50. Uh, but the big problem from a FreeBSD point of view is uh, there's no memory management unit and it's an M mode, M mode only uh, board. So the work required to support running on this is large and um, the Linux RISC-V community uh, has done this work. So they can run Linux on, with this, on this tiny no MMU board um, that's machine mode only, but it definitely has taken them a lot of work to do so. And we don't have the resources for that. And it's hard to tell if something like this would be worth those resources. So um, unfortunately that wasn't as promising an option as it seemed. Um, the Micro Semi Polar Fire platform, the, also called the Icicle Kit. So I think they announced this this year and around Q2. Um, it's still up for sale and, and you, can, you can order one now. Um, it's built on top of the same cores as the High Five Unleashed, but it includes an FPGA uh, on board. So you can test out different um, you can basically flash different hardware designs that you want to modify the system with. Um, this is a little more reasonably priced at 500 USD, um, but it's still quite a lot for um, what it is. You have to be interested in owning this particular piece of RISC-V hardware. It's not comparable to you know, an ARM board of the same. Uh, but that is a new option uh, of a FreeBSD capable uh, board that we will hopefully support soon. Also, um, Sci Five announced another board just over a week ago called the Unmatched, Hi Five Unmatched. This one's going for 665 USD, and it's the first ever RISC-V PC. So it comes in a mini ITX uh, form factor, and it's a PC. It has a PCI Express, uh, everything you could need. I think it's a pretty good marketing move on Sci-Fi's uh, position because it basically is pushing RISC-V to you know, a new level where oh, uh, anybody can own a RISC-V PC. Again, it's, this is for people who are um, enthusiastic about the platform and RISC-V developers and things like that. Otherwise, the price for performance is not comparable. But I think that this is an important um, 
board for FreeBSD to try and support. Because um, once this is uh, shipped, which should be by the end of this year, this will be the most powerful uh, piece of RISC-V hardware available. Um, where RISC-V really shines at the moment is there's a large number of uh, soft cores, so things that you can flash to FPGAs, research cores, um, hardware that is not fabricated yet. Um, I won't go into too much detail on that, but you should just search RISC-V cores list if you want to find out more about that. Um, what's next for uh, FreeBSD RISC-V as a platform? So we've definitely seen some improvements from where we started. We initially were running in this tiny spike simulator that was too slow to do anything. Um, now we run on some real hardware. I think I forgot to mention it, but FreeBSD does support the Hi5 Unleashed. It will support these other two boards, and the Polar Fire and the Hi5 Unmatched. So um, where are we going next? I think the big thing that's missing right now is uh, the lack of pre-compiled packages. So FreeBSD has the ports framework, which allows you to build third-party software from scratch. It's great. It's, it's really portable across platforms with some exceptions. Um, but the problem is compiling ports is slow, especially if you're trying to do it inside QMU. So from a usability point of view, if I download a FreeBSD RISC-V image and I boot it up in QMU and I want to, you know, I want to set up my preferred uh, shell. So I do package install bash. It's not available. We can't build these packages yet. Um, so I think that's a, a big hurdle to be overcome. I don't think it's that far away though. Um, so we've done some testing of this. We can build ports natively. It's just really slow. Um, and we can also cross build them using QMU user mode emulation. So rather than trying to emulate an entire um, RISC-V system, you can emulate just the user space and cross compile ports using that and a native compiler. It's faster, but it's not totally um, perfect. There are some issues to iron out in the user mode emulation still that makes this an imperfect solution. So what we really need is a is some RISC-V hardware to build and serve a dedicated set of um, pre-compiled packages. Even if it's a small subset of the entire ports infrastructure, I think that's a useful thing that FreeBSD RISC-V as a platform needs. Um, what else is on the horizon? I'm working to get uh, weekly development snapshots built. So um, you can go on the FreeBSD website right now and download a, uh, once a week, there are new snapshots built for uh, AMD64, ARM64, pretty much every platform, except RISC-V at this point. Um, so some of the work that has been done in the last couple of years including the uh, bootloader stuff and the open SBI stuff has made it so that this is now an achievable goal. Um, so I, I'd like to start generating um, development snapshots that people can just download and run in QMU or if they happen to have a RISC-V development board, they can flash it there. Um, definitely we wanna see support for the Polar Fire Icicle Kit the, and the High Five Unmatched. Um, 
where since we support the High Five Unleashed, these platforms are pretty similar. So it's it shouldn't be too much work. And I think it's important to do so. Um, some other stuff I'd like to see performance man monitoring counters. There's a spec being proposed for that. Some improvements to the um, the PMAP module and um, other things like EDK2, which is another uh, EFI firmware. Um, and a big wish list of things. Be nice to see in the future some of the proposed risk five extensions like the vector extension or the bit manip extension or the uh the sim the some of the upcoming extensions it would be nice to see support for those when they're um when they're kind of made official uh SV48, the 48-bit virtual addressing scheme, it'd be good to see that supported eventually. And RISC-V Beehive, a little bit of a pipe dream, but also ARM64 will have Beehive support in the not too distant future. So maybe it's more achievable than uh, it seemed to be two years ago. Um, so that's most of that's pretty much what I have. Um, so I just want to say thank you to um, everyone who has worked on this project in the last couple of years. Uh, I think when I started contributing, there were a handful of people, maybe four or five, that were interested in this project. And now um, there's definitely more committers who are thinking about or committing to or using. FreeBSD on Risk Five, so thank you to everyone who's been part of that. And um, if you want to get in touch or find out more, these are the places to do so. Um, that's all I have. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Okay, thank you for that great presentation. Uh, we are waiting, so please put your questions in the chat if you have them. You did such a good job. There are no questions. <laughs> I had some questions um, thinking about uh, what you just talked about it needing hardware uh, for the mm -hmm. package build and um, and also supporting the uh, high five uh, unmatched. So do you will there be people within that? That team of people who are supporting Risk Five, do you think that they will be adding the support? Um, yes. So, I mean, it. it I guess it depends uh, who chooses to obtain one. So, um, I'm definitely interested in trying to get one of those High Five Unmatched boards. Uh, after two years of working within the confines of the emulator, it'd be nice to have a piece of hardware for myself. In this case, I would probably try to do it, but um, maybe other people will beat me to the punch. I know there's okay. at least one developer who has that uh, micro semi polar fire board and will probably lead that effort. Okay, so, so it, it sounds like it makes sense for us to maybe get one for the infrastructure for yeah for the cluster i think so i think it like i said it's not too different from the existing high five board at least on first impressions so th that means some of the work is already done okay so i think ann's gonna pipe in because i i think we have yes. some questions now i have a couple of questions um sure. the first one is uh drivers for unmatched Mm -hmm. PCIe. Um, there are some PCIe drivers um, already that have been used for um, some of the FPGA boards that people have booted. I have not been involved in that work, so 
it's hard to say what it's hard to say how well that will work out of the box. Okay. Um, there's another question. Um, they want to know is all this work documented somewhere? Um, yes. Yeah, so the wiki page has um, instructions for kind of how to get started with stuff. Um, it's you know, it's always a work in progress, but it, it um, the wiki page has a lot of information. Uh, I don't know if it's well documented, um, all of the, you know, progress we've made, that's kind of documented in the, the source control, but at least if you wanted to get started running a FreeBSD RISC V instance, there is documentation to do so. And I'm always trying to make it easier to do so. Okay, one more question. Uh, do you think at some point in time there will be a Raspberry Pi like board for RISC V? Well, an expensive yeah. access. Um, there was one project that was kind of shooting for that trajectory that I think has slowed down, but the low risk project, L O W R I C. RISC, um, they wanted to develop an open hardware Raspberry Pi like system on a chip. Um, there are some others. There are a couple other projects I don't recall the name, but that's their goal too. They want to eventually build a, you know, a commodity chip that's you can purchase for, you know, $35. Um, but the reality is that it's that won't be for a couple of years that it reaches that point, I think. Okay. Um, any other questions? Well, if you have questions, you can always post them afterwards in this uh, chat box, chat window. And we'll also post the, the wiki page here too, so you can, uh, you know where to go for that. So I want to thank you, Mitchell, for doing this talk. I found it really interesting. I didn't realize this was your first talk, so this uh, I thought you did a great job. So thank again, thanks for doing this, and I'm glad we were able to pull you away from all this backpacking that you've been spending your free time on. Yeah. <laughs> At least you stayed close to home. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. It's been uh, it was fun. Yeah, I yeah I found it very interesting because we don't we we don't hear a lot about Risk Five and and I know that there are companies using it and um, I know of at least one who's using it with uh, FreeBSD on it and so that's always exciting and in fact next week at the vendor summit the there's the one of the companies that's using FreeBSD and Risk Five will be giving a talk, so that'll be interesting to hear their perspective too, and why they chose FreeBSD. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so like I said, if people have any questions, they can always post it here in IRC. And I w wanted to let everyone know that in two weeks, so we do these talks every every two weeks on Fridays. And so the next one will be November 20th, and it will be an introduction to D-Trace by Mark Johnston. So uh, another interesting topic, and just a chance for all of us to learn all these different areas of FreeBSD. So again, thank you, Mitchell, and thank you everyone who watched this. <laughs>